Welcome back. You're watching SA Today. Thanks for staying with the SABC News Channel. Let's turn our focus here now. The theme of this year's high-level political forum on the Sustainable Development Goal is building back better from COVID-19 while advancing the full implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Now, the forum currently underway in New York is also reviewing in depth a number of SDGs, including Goal 4 on Quality Education, Goal 5 five on gender equality and goal 14 on life below water among others now leading the south african delegation at un headquarters is the minister in the presidency monthly gungwele and he's standing by live with our correspondent sherwin bryce peace sherwin over to you Unati, thanks very much indeed. And our venue for this discussion is the United <coughs> Nations Correspondents Association, located on the third floor of UN headquarters here in Manhattan, New York. You correctly point out that the Minister in the Presidency, Monli Gungabela, has been leading South Africa's delegation at the high level political forum on the sustainable development goals, essentially a gathering that seeks to build momentum towards the all important SDG summit that the UN Secretary General will host next year. Monli Gungabela, the Minister in the Presidency, welcome back to New York. Welcome to the United Nations and good to see you. Good morning, Sharon. Good morning to your viewership. Thanks for the opportunity. Minister, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, told the forum this week, quote, our world is in deep trouble and so too are the sustainable development goals, calling for resolve and solidarity to rescue the SDGs. In your submission to the forum, you state that rather than finding ourselves in the closing decade of implementation, we are back at the starting line of the 2030 agenda. What are the implications of that for South Africa, given the context we are experiencing there, the burgeoning and palpable frustration that people are feeling on the ground? Actually, it means we're back, showing to be confronted with all the demeanors of a frustrated society, especially those who are historically disadvantaged those who are on the negative side of the socio-economic infrastructure, access to water, access to sanitation, access to basic infrastructure for schooling. It means we are faced with those people whose hope is on the edge. The UN chief also warned, Minister, that the world faced cascading crises that are causing profound suffering today essentially what you're telling me, and carry the seeds of dangerous inequality, instability, and climate chaos tomorrow. South Africa already witnessed elements of widespread instability last year. The climate crisis was brought into sharp focus by the devastating floods in KZN and the Eastern Cape earlier this year. Some believe, Minister, that South Africa is on a slippery slope and that these are the early examples of what is to come. What do you say to that? We, well, I, I don't share that view. South Africa has got a history of positive leadership, positive... Not most recently, it doesn't. No, no, the, the, the symptoms that you have now, I want to argue, are not the symptoms of the majority of South Africans, but they are symptoms of something which is not going fine. South Africans have been in worse conditions than this, and South Africans, in a united way, have demonstrated their ability to get out of that trouble. Remember pandemic, we never had an idea what kind of a monster that was. But in spite of what it exposed in as far as fault line in infrastructure, no access to water, poor environment, congested, uh, co congested communities who could not even social distance, South Africans found a way, coherent as a nation, to actually survive. Now we've got highest percentage of uh, immunity uh, of immun Im Im immunity immunity Im 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 no, no. the level of immunity as a as a society is quite very high uh, all those things have been achieved by a nation which demonstrated resilience in the face of unpredicted uh, unprecedented adverse situation Minister, the South African country statement to the forum says the following, calling this mid-pandemic situation where we find ourselves grave and further compounded in the African continent by severe liquidity and debt crises. 
The pandemic, you say, is exacerbating poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and has had disproportional, uh, disproportional impact on the most vulnerable countries and sectors of society, including women and the youth. But, Minister, if we are being forthright, it's not only the pandemic that has demonstrated these fault lines that you talk about. Am I right? Yes, uh, there's a number of factors. We, we don't hide in South Africa, for instance, what the state capture did. And um, even we've also acknowledged uh, even the state, the capacity of the state, how it has been contributing to this. So we, it, we, we see it in that context that the leadership of the president Cyril Ramaphosa focuses as one of the priority of the state, what to call capacity, uh, skills, and access to skills and education, and uh, economic transformation. Those are the apex sort of priorities. They respond to the underlying factors which actually made us have more negative consequences from the pandemic than nations that were better developed by not than us. But in the South African country statement, the focus is on what the pandemic has done in terms of why the SDGs have not been implemented to the extent that one might have expected. I'm saying to you that there are reasons that preceded the pandemic where the decline in terms of that implementation was there for all to see. Why not mention state capture and the elements of corruption that have permeated South African society and really impeded the South African government's ability to implement the National Development Plan, which I think feeds into the 2030 agenda? State capture, Sharon, is a narrative that we have articulated and we'll do it every day. The only issue is that we didn't mention in the speech. But you know it's not a matter that we hide. Wherever we speak, it's our ongoing narratives. Because one of the worst things uh, when you are confronted with a challenge is when you demonstrate uh, negation of your weaknesses, negations of all the fault lines where you work, not accepting your underperformance. If you don't accept your underperformance or your weaknesses, you will not give confidence to deal with those. Whenever in South Africa we confront the implementation of the economic recovery, uh, dealing with the changing of structural reforms and making sure that our economic recovery is led through infrastructure, we've always said we are aware that we are confronted with a history which is more burdened by, by the consequences of the state capture. So the fact that we didn't put it here is no sign of uh, an attempt to hide it. To avoid it, right. So, mm. Minister, you'd agree that like, there are, there's a critical need in South Africa today in communities for some, you know, for the pressure points, if you will, to be relieved. Uh, Added on top of the inflation, uh, on top of the pandemic, you have now pressures of inflation, high fuel costs, in addition to a power deficit in the country, leaving the national development plan really uh, in uncharted waters in many ways. It's a decade old, and this thing is still not bearing the fruits that that uh, you know ten years ago we were told would happen. I mean, who takes responsibility for that? Well, as South Africans, we accept responsibility for our. For our, for our underworkings or mm -hmm. underperformance. I've said that, but you, as you have already said, as we have been trying since 2008, remember since 2008, our economy has never performed, hardly performed beyond 2%, except recently in 2021. The issue of energy has always been one of those issues. Now we're confronted with the price pressures which are beyond our control. Uh, particularly emanating from the Ukraine-Russian situation. Uh, but uh, in terms of what I would refer to as inflation differentials compared to other countries, I want to argue our prices are still better contained as compared to what I see outside South Africa. But I know South Africa are going through pain because of these prices. The former statistician general, uh, Dr. Padi Lehoshla, says the NDP was never implemented. This is what he said in January last year. He was speaking to SABC News. He said the NDP was never implemented. It was left on the shelves. So even the framing of a course correction is wrong terminology. So the framing shows the poverty of the, MP, uh, the uh, NDP to actually confront the reality. Lehoshla notes how key targets in developing South Africa have not been met. For instance, the target of unemployment was supposed to be at 14 
in 2015. We know it is now at around 34 percent, Minister. Uh, for education, the targets for successfully passing matric maths and science in 2015 were 198,000 and 186,000 respectively against the actual numbers that were a quarter of that, 53,000 and 42,000. How are you going to reinvigorate the NDP? Uh, if you allow me to go back, Sherry, that's why under the leadership of this president, our focus is on state capacity because a number of those issues you're talking about is state capacity. My next question is here, yeah, does the African government re, have capacity? Re, 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 regulatory costs and uh, your a spectrum that took more than 10 years to be actually released, uh, the, the rail infrastructure, which actually cost us opportunities we could have used even currently. Remember the Ukraine-Russian situation created a new demand for coal, but because of the limitations there. So that's why the state capacity, that's why the skills, mm -hmm. state capacity together with the skills prior to one and two, together with the economic transformation, infrastructure-led, making sure that through a Vulindela project, we are improving the structural reforms. There's a lot of improvement now in as far as the structural reforms are concerned, in as far as water issues, in as far as water infrastructure intervention, in as far as, uh, I've already spoken about the spectrum, white paper on the rail, uh, having actually created a situation where a third party participant in the rail freight between the interland and what you call in the port, and uh, also allowing a new partner uh, in the Kabeha, mm -hmm. what you call terminal in the Deben partnership to ensure that there is competition. So there are interventions which take into account the issues that you're speaking about. But you Those agree, Minister, South Africa does face a capacity and a skills deficit, right? especially in the public sector. That's our approach in terms of priority one and two. One of the big topics of conversation in terms of the sustainable development context is the issue of climate change. You mentioned fossil fuels, the need to better manage our natural resources while changing our consumption patterns, particularly around fossil fuels. The South African position is that we should be careful not to advocate a one-size-fits-all approach to disinvestment from fossil fuels. That's in your statement. But the UN says that you are simply wrong and that fossil fuels must be cut by 45% by 2030 with the aim of achieving net zero emissions by 2050. I put it to you, therefore, Minister, what is the relationship between South Africa's short-term and medium-term economic and employment needs and the climate catastrophe that the science tells us is coming? Well, South Africa is not uh, in a contradictory mode in as far as those are concerned. There's unanimity in South Africa in as far as decarbonation, towards 2050. The, 20, the net zero ca carbon 2050, we are committed to that. All stakeholders, l uh, what to call labor federations, business, the state, there is no debate. The only debate that could actually, that tends to manifest is in how best to work in that direction. You, you, you just leave coal, that's why we say just transition. Right. Common but differentiated. Yes, now we, we, when we say leave no one behind, as we talk about moving away from coal, there is some Kungubele in some rural area who has got no other alternative. Coal is the only way of giving fire, paraffin, and so on. As you move ahead, you create a new economy, a new infrastructure that as people leave their old way, of heating their stove and so on. There's opportunities for them to sustain them at work. We're not only confronted by that, by the way. You know, no less than 34% of South Africans are unemployed, about 10 million. So in other words, as we move forward uh, decarb on, on a decarbonated, decarbonated process, we make sure that everyone see hope in the new direction because the worst thing, the least you cannot afford, is when majority of South Africans, as we speak now, 20% uh, of South Africans are, are, are in the hold of the wealth, 70% of the wealth of the country. If you say to the 80%, we are just moving with no clear alternatives for their future, you are actually counterproductive to the very noble decarbonating what you call program. So South Africa needs a renewable energy revolution is what you're saying? Yes. What's that looking like? 
we are we we we've moved in that significant number of windows have been what to call have been approved now as we speak now during this current crisis we are also accepting that the speed in as far as allowing more right. renewal what to call uh, entrances should be changed we are also dealing with you remember the president would have said from 10 megawatts in the in a embedded what to call generation to 100 we all we already discovered that even that hundred has not moved at the speed we anticipated. There's a lot of EIAs and a lot of other regulatory things. Yeah. As I spoke to you about capacity of the state, mm -hmm. we need an agile government. That's why the president has appointed Mr. Siponkosi to deal with the issues of red tape so that we make sure that the freeway for these interventions is as less obstructive as possible. Minister, the taps are running dry in Gebeha. Uh, the same happened in Cape Town uh, a few years back and in many smaller municipalities in the country. You can't achieve the SDGs if you don't have access to reliable water provision. You can't achieve the SDGs if you have stage six uh, load shedding with no real timelines for when that reliable power will be generated. You say the SDGs will only be attained if there is adequate provision of predictable, appropriate and accessible means of implementation support to developing countries, especially to Africans and so on. But you also need, you touched on this earlier, you also need competence in the public service. Does South Africa have the requisite competence and skills, particularly <coughs> at the local level where the SDGs, <coughs> where the rubber hits the road, essentially, right? You know, uh, in our Vulin Lela uh, approach, which is turning around the structural reforms, one of the areas of that reform is allowing skills to, to cross our borders into South Africa. Uh, you remember we have to balance between uh, ensuring that the only skills we get in South Africa are those which you don't have. Already uh, there is an agreement on the type of skills that we should source from outside. At the same time, we are reorganizing our Tibet colleges. We are reorganizing even ensuring that our education is aligned to the economic demands. Remember, it's a fourth industrial revolution. We are going very deep into the IT area to make sure that just recently the Minister in Communication uh, table before the government, the SA Connect, uh, in other words, internet penetration right. throughout the country. All those interventions are capacity interventions to make sure that even a child in the hinterland, in the rural community, is able to have access to internet at a lesser cost, probably free if they can. So the issue of capacity we are very conscious of mm -hmm. is the number of interventions in that regard. Finance Minister Inor Godangwana was in Komani in the Eastern Cape this week, uh, said that the National Treasury found 150 municipalities in the country were bankrupt or insolvent. That's more than half of the 257 municipalities that we have in South Africa, Minister. If these are the entities that are responsible for implementing the SDGs, how on earth, given the insolvency numbers and bankruptcy numbers we are seeing coming out of National Treasury, is this going to be achieved? Listen, in the Vulin Lela program, which is deal with the marriage of structural reforms. One of the things now we are considering is local government. We are making a case that unless local government is in the radar on a regular basis, whatever commitment be, be, uh, by investors, be they international or domestic, if the local space where this intervention is going, this investment is going to take a place, you cannot predict the approval of article of publications. You, you don't have a network for power flow. You don't have access roads. You cannot guarantee a health infrastructure for business to triumph. You must, I'm sure you know, you must have heard not long ago, Liqua municipality where 3,200 workers were on the verge of losing jobs because of access road. Lechtenberg, where Clover had to move to go to Durban because of the manner in... To us, the issue of the state of municipality, especially from the point of infrastructure, skills, and uh, proper political deployment. We have accepted that. Uh, political deployment has actually been uh, disappointing. Uh, that came up in the Zondo Commission yes, report, yes. right? So you so, acknowledge So we, we, we are aware of those, mm -hmm. and Minister Godogon and the Minister of Kokta, Minister Kosazan, are actually leading uh, the, the, the drive in actually dealing with that situation. We have a it's few one more minutes the, left. Yeah. I just want to get this in, Minister. Mm -hmm. Goal 16 of the SDGs talks about the importance of peace, justice, and strong institutions. That's Goal 16. Mm -hmm. The Zondo Commission uh, cost the country a lot of money. They say over a billion rand. 
and the questions are piling up about what accountability looks like. What does justice look like in this instance, given that justice is a very key peg of the sustainable development agenda? When this president took over 2018, his immediate thing, his intervention was capacitating of the judicial institutions, in particular national security, national prosecution uh, uh, institution, including the investigative uh, uh, institutions. We've got something called the fusion that pulls together various uh, uh, institutions for investigations. Remember we used to have before Hawks uh, a scorpion, which was a um, true state capture, I want to argue, uh, dissipated into a very weak thing. So the immediate thing this president did was to actually turn around that. Even in now, now, now this year, in the budget that uh, the Minister of Finance provided, no less than 8.7 billion goes to the police and no less than billion goes to justice. And there's also discussions with the private sector to make sure that we amass our resources to improve prosecutorial or to call capacity. At the same time, investigative capacity, intelligence capacity. You remember the Sydney Mufumada report of the, the High yes. Panel Review mm -hmm. saying that the SSA is a hollowed institution. We, we are moving at a, at a healthy pace in trying to turn around those institutions because no country worth its salt can allow an intelligence community to be in the in the in the state which it was found because I usually say to the team that I work with an intelligence uh, unit is the antenna of the nation it needs therefore the best skills in the country so those are some of the things we're actually dealing with now as I'm speaking you say that the Russia Ukraine war severely eroded uh, renewed hope for the global community emerging from COVID-19 eroded hope and divided the world once again and diverted us from the SG's common agenda. Greg Mills of the Brenters Foundation writes in Daily Maverick this week that Africa's response to the Russian invasion has so far been weak. Has the time come, Minister, for the posture of countries like South Africa and others on the African continent to change, given the links that you yourself have drawn between this war and rising food costs and energy costs and many other factors that are impeding social development on the continent? Well, uh, if you look at our priorities, Sharon, priority seven is about better Africa and better world. And South Africa's philosophy is that a, a prosperous society is a peaceful society. And South Africa has sharpened her skills in actually making sure that we are a, a viable tool for peace anywhere in the world. And to retain the status we always have to make sure that both conflicting parties see us as thus because immediately you go in a fighting situation and try to think that you want to choose who is better you have actually cost yourself the opportunity to actually make it. south africa has got a history in as far as that in the ireland we were there as we, in, in saudi arabia i can list a number of mm -hmm. countries mm -hmm. the reason we're being called we have passed the test of being objective and neutral at all material times because whenever these institutes these countries are fighting there is no innocent what to call but as a UN no member state party. you would agree that only one country has violated the sovereignty of another country that violates the UN Charter as a, as a signatory to the, the UN Charter which South Africa is we, you can agree minister that only one country here has has violated the sovereignty of another country not so our attitude is that it doesn't matter who you are, whether you are a friend of South Africa, anyone who destabilizes society, who is responsible for the killing, we always are going to frown upon that. But who is really responsible for conflict is a position we are very careful mm -hmm. in taking because we want to assist in the reconciliation of that situation. Minister, thanks for coming to visit with me. We really do appreciate it, and I wish you uh, every success on the remaining time you have here with us in New York. Good thanks for the opportunity. Right. Thank right. you very much. Minister Mondli Gungabella, don't move. Uh, South Africa's Minister in the Presidency speaking to us here at the conclusion concludes today the high-level political forum on sustainable development that now sets the path towards that all-important SDG summit that the Secretary General will be hosting here in New York. And of course, with eight years to go until that 2030 deadline, Countries are finding the going tough in terms of implementation of the SDGs and South Africa certainly. UNATI is no exception. Back to you.
Fantastic show and Bryce Peace there in conversation with the Minister in the Presidency, Mondli Gungubela, of course, the Minister touching on some pertinent issues that are currently affecting South Africa at this point in time. Of course, the forum, which is currently underway in New York, also touching on a number of issues, reviewing uh, in depth a number of sustainable development goals, including Goal 4, uh, which is uh, on quality education, and of course, Goal 5 on gender equality, and Goal 14 on life below water, among others. We'll be watching and monitoring that very closely.